am. Okay. I am James Renwick Manship Sr. of Mount Vernon, Virginia. I'm currently at the offices of Maryland Court Watch in uh, Temple Hills, Maryland, and meeting with uh, a documentary journalist to discuss the courts and juries and grand juries. And you have a particular expertise in the grand jury process and you've tried to uh, get the grand jury to act here in, the, uh, in Virginia, is that correct? Yes, um, well, we're Virginia. currently in Maryland, but right, I have right. tried to do it in Virginia. Virginia. But on January 1st, I was down in Chester, Virginia, and I happened to be Googling, and I found something of the Virginia Supreme Court Handbook for Grand Jurors. I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so I started reading it, and Section 23 and Section 26 um, one of them said, the grand jury made up of private citizens is the one non-political body with the authority to investigate and indict government agencies and officials for wrongdoing. That's not an exact quote, but that covers a lot of what's said. And then I tracked it down further and I found, I think it's 19.2, 192 through 206 or something like that. They're the actual Virginia Code sections upon which the Virginia Supreme Court handbook was derived. And if you go to that code on the grand jury, it's uh, very obtuse to tr try and figure out how it works. Essentially, if a citizen wants to go to a grand jury, you've got uh, three different ways to accomplish that. One, you can go to the uh, Commonwealth Attorney and say, I'd like to speak before the grand jury. And since that's pretty much the purview of the Commonwealth Attorney, he's not too likely, or she's not too likely, to let you do that. Well, then you can go to the Chief Judge. But the Chief Judge and the Chief Commonwealth Attorney pretty much work, you know, lockstep, hand in hand, you know, whatever you want to call it, shoulder to shoulder. So he's not too likely to do that for you either. Well, the reality is, is the constitutional officer there are two constitutional officers involved here. One is the Commonwealth Attorney and one is the Clerk of the Circuit Court, elected by the people. And that person has essentially the administrative duty for the grand jury to put, set up the docket for the grand jury to consider. Well, a lot of those are going to be proposed by the Commonwealth Attorney or police and various other uh, law enforcement um, personnel who go to the grand jury and make their presentments. But the individual citizen has the right to as well. All right, stop there. I mean, is that an absolute right? I mean, that, that right's been secured <coughs> since the beginning, right? Yes, it is an absolute right. It's a right that's under great assault by members of the bar in Virginia, and I'd be willing to bet all over the United States. Um, because why, why, why don't they want citizens to go to grand juries, the bar? Because that's their job. The you know administration of the courts and the administration of the criminal justice system is supposed to be uh, deferred to lawyers and judges and police officers. And individual citizens are, their, pretty much their only role is to be defendants or jurors. <laughs> Other than that, they, they really have, have been relegated to... Well, they're to lying to us, right? Well, if you want to call it lying, that's one way of doing it. That They don't really say you can't do it. They just say we're not going to let you. There's a slight difference between I those. don't think so. All right, well... <laughs> <laughs> if you if I if you if you may allow me to, to do that, that. that's fine. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm being, shall we say, slightly ironic or or uh, sarcastic in that comment. Uh -huh. um, but the the reality is is okay. How can what is the the third way that you can go to a special grand jury? You can go to a regular grand jury, and there you have two options. 
if the judge refuses you a grand jury, then you can go to the regular grand jury, and if a minority of the members vote for a special grand jury to be convened, then... What members? Of the grand jury, oh, of the okay. regular grand okay. jury. Okay. okay, If a minority of the members of the regular grand jury, which okay. basically meets at least once a month, okay. vote to convene a special grand jury, mm -hmm. then... The judge, it goes, if a minority, it goes to the judge to decide whether or not a grand jury will be, con a special grand jury will be convened. However, what do you mean? What, listen, or, listen. Whether or not, I mean, why does he get any discretion on it? Because I said a minority, oh. the judge, they may. Okay. If a majority uh -huh. of the members of the regular grand jury say we want a special grand jury, then the judge shall convene. A special grand jury. So it's a two pronged decision. Okay. So a regular grand jury is from five to seven jurors. Okay. A special grand jury is from seven to eleven grand jurors. Well, that's a weird number. Cause, cause Seven to eleven, not you know. So yeah. it, I mean, judge panels are usually six and twelve, and also regular juries are six. And well, 12. in Connecticut, but most of the time in in Virginia, uh -huh. you have an odd number of jurors. Weird. Well, that's a better. That's a better system, so you don't have fun juries. Well, but the the reality is, in Virginia, it's got to be unanimous verdict, so uh -huh. it could be even as well as odd. Uh -huh. Because if it's got to be unanimous, it doesn't make any difference if it's even or odd. Well, for cr criminal charges, but not for civil ch charges. Civil charges would be a different. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'm pretty sure on civil charges with a jury, it's also a majority. Unanimous. Yes. Because it's not clear. I'm not. I'm not sure about that. It's not. It's not um, beyond reasonable doubt kind of. Uh, standard. I I can't speak to that. I've been. Uh, I've I've dealt standard. with. Criminal issues. I'm tr uh, currently trying to get to uh, criminal issues uh, on the grand. Well, jury. I don't mean to get off the track here. Let's get back to the grand jury and our right to approach the grand jury. So and, anyway, and the let us say that five members right. of a regular grand jury yeah. voted on your presentment. All right, they, if two did it, then the presiding judge would have to make the decision. If three did it. The presiding judge would have no decision. Uh -huh. He'd have to do it. Uh -huh. Okay, that's the the issue. Now, I went and filed my first petition for special grand jury mm -hmm. on the twenty first of January, uh -huh. and that very same day, a judge surprised the legal community in Virginia by retiring early, and of course he was one of the targets of the you know, proposed special grand jury. Well, that wouldn't stop him from charges even though he's retired. I understand, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that was um, what happened on the 21st of January. Mm -hmm. I went to the grand jury on the 15th of February in Winchester, Virginia. Mm -hmm. The judge in the case, John Wetzel, is the same judge who on the 3rd of April, 1995, compared Army veteran Jeffrey Franklin Washington to Adolf Hitler. Most people I say that to say, well, that doesn't sound like a very unbiased judge. And I think most people would tend to agree with that. Uh, a week later, that unbiased judge sentenced Jeffrey Washington to 70 years in jail on an Alfred plea. That Alfred plea by, if you read the Alfred decision, Supreme Court case, says that you have to have evidence and competent counsel. There was zero evidence against Jeff Washington. Zero. All right? There were witnesses who originally said that he had nothing to do with it, but then they made plea bargains with the prosecution, and now they said that Jeff Washington was the gunman. However, there was a gunshot residue test done of Jeff Washington that showed that he had no gunshot residue on him. So if he was the gunman, how did he have no gunshot residue on him? 
Was he was he a doctor or a judge or a jury? He was brought before a jury, but in the opening statement, the prosecutor made this elaborate case of how much, you know, what a bad person he was and he was the gunman and everything. Mm -hmm. And his defense counsel, this person who later became a lawyer who resigned when the Commonwealth, I mean, when the uh, special grand jury thing was done, basically whispered to the jury. He says, I'm so sorry, I've got a bad throat, that's why I didn't do the void jury yesterday. And so he did a very milk toast presentation on the opening argument. People who were in the court, including Jeff Washington's mother uh -huh. and another woman, said after the opening arguments, she thought that Jeff was guilty. All right. Then what the prosecutor did in addition is there was still one alibi witness. Now understand originally there were five alibi witnesses and he did the prosecutor did plea bargains with all these other people to get them to switch their story to say that Jeff was the murderer, the gunman. Mm -hmm. Jeff still had one alibi witness. And the police officer grabbed him as he came into the courthouse, took him to the prosecutor's office, basically, you know, harassed him in the office, and then he came and told the defense counsel and the Washington family that this man had flipped and was going to testify against Jeff. I've got affidavits that show this man saying, I never said that. Okay, and there was another person who was there who was also harassed and saw this thing. Well, I mean, who's bringing forth that, that evidence but the prosecutor having and, and, and cahoots with whoever? Nobody is allowing it to be brought forth. That's the corruption of the system. That's why I'm trying to get a special grand jury, uh -huh. is to be able to present this evidence to show how Brady violations were being done uh -huh. by this prosecutor. Uh -huh. Now, I wasn't able to get that done. However, on... Uh, why? Let's because the system is corrupt, that's why. Okay, so what, how, how did they defeat you? What technicality did they knock you out on? What, what did they do? Because right. that's the kind of things I'm looking for. On the, fifth, the, the trappings of the court, as well said in the verdict, the movie, The Verdict with Paul Newman, you, talk, you had that glory. Did you ever see that incredible film? No. The Verdict with Paul Newman? No. Okay, well, he, he's talking to, to the jury at the end. And he says, you know, the, the law is just a dream, it's just a wish. We must look beyond the trappings of the court, because today you are the law. That you, is correct. You are the law. The, the jury very, very is the law. Scene. <laughs> well, I'll have to look at it. <laughs> I am, go, I am not much of a movie goer, yeah. oh. so I, I don't know. That's an old film, but uh, great. But in answer to your question, um, something like the 27th of January. Can I get you just to scoot over a little bit in the yeah. middle? Okay. I mean, if you want to be diagonal. That, that's fine. Because, that, on the, because I'll tell you why. Because I don't want the white wall. I just want the fine. bookcase. Okay, go ahead. On the 27th of January, yeah. I wrote a letter to the presiding judge, Wetzel, who's the same man who compared mm -hmm. Washington to Adolf Hitler. Um, that's and, incredible. <laughs> and I've got court transcripts to prove it. Now, now <laughs> that's an interesting story in and of itself. Because I had determined that various court transcripts were disappearing from the court files, which happens to be a felony, by the way. Mm -hmm. And the way we knew that this comparison with Adolf Hitler had been done is that a reporter said it. The reporter Darcy Spencer for the Northern Virginia Daily said mm -hmm. it. Another reporter, Brian Root for the Winchester Star, didn't say that, but he said that there were... Nazi stormtroopers. So the fact that you have Nazi stormtroopers and Adolf Hitler, you know, it, there was a commonality. So I said, I want to see what the transcript said was actually spoken. Mm -hmm. Because I have a, a commonality yeah, between two be writer, writers. And you didn't find it. No. I said to Jeff's father, go with about $75 in your pocket to the courthouse, 
look at the April 3rd, 1995 transcripts and make a copy of it before you leave that office or else it will never be seen again. And he did. And sure enough, it says both Adolf Hitler and Nazi stormtroopers. So both reporters were right. Uh -huh. All right. So I use that bit when this judge was going up for being promoted to the Court of Appeals and I went to the Courts of Justice Committee, the Senate and House Courts of Justice Committee on, in the Virginia Legislature, and I said, today is February 4th. On this day in 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by Heinrich Hitler, Hitler's henchman. Heinrich now, Himmler. Heinrich Himmler, Himmler, Hitler's henchman. Yeah. Now, what does that have to do with us today in Richmond, Virginia, in the Courts of Justice Committee on February 4th, 2009? Well, it just so happens that one of the six judges before you to be selected for promotion to the Court of Appeals on the 3rd of April, 1995, and I've got court transcripts to prove it, uh -huh. compared Army veteran Jeff Washington to Adolf Hitler. Come in. Hey, how you doing? Oh, how George, you doing? where are you coming from? Well, I'm just about 15 so, minutes away. Anyway, that... Uh, here's, here's George McDermott. I'm meeting him for the first time. I'm meeting you for the Why first time. Why don't you cut time. this off and let's have our greetings. Well, this is good, you know. Let's yeah. get a little social thing here. Yeah. We'll, we'll shake, shake hands again and get it on camera. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. How right. was your trip down? You want some coffee? Uh, well, it was a little rough with that, all that rain, but uh, I got here. Okay, let me uh, pause this. George. <laughs> okay. Well, we're sitting... Well, I'll give you some background on myself. Well, let me do an introduction at okay. least. Okay. All right. So we're sitting here with uh, uh, two very hardworking activists in the uh, D.C. area. And George, could you please introduce yourself? And uh, George McCarthy. And, and about uh, two minutes on on what you've been doing and how many years you've been doing it and what you're hoping to accomplish. Go. Uh, George McDermott. I'm a. Uh, Activist, I've been actively involved uh, in trying to get justice, not only for myself, but for other people uh, since 1987 when I decided, found out that the justice system in this country is not working for the majority of the people. Uh, I had several businesses, I won't go into that, that's all available on my website at secretjustice.com. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, I had the misfortune of falling into uh, a system where those with wealth just came in and steamrolled over myself, my partners, and stole our business. And I did not find out until years later that they were all working with the political system within Prince George's County, Maryland. And they had an ultimate agenda to steal the property, to steal my business, and to take over uh, for themselves the ideas that I had put in place. And they did it. They, all the means that they used were illegal. I have. Uh, been in court since I filed my first case in 1994. Since then, there are roughly 112 other cases that have been uh, I've been involved in, defending my rights and those of my partners. And how far did you get with all those all those cases? 112, you said. 112 cases. Uh, well, all, all the basic cases, it, it comes down to five cases, really. Okay? It, it started out with a bankruptcy fraud. It started in 1987. That, uh, the chief judge, bankruptcy judge in Maryland, uh, 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 
well, they've, they've used the bankruptcy court systems to uh, loot the, the economy of the state of Maryland and give them to well-connected political allies and cronies of the, uh, the Saperstein crime syndicate in Maryland who many people think that the mafia is gone. Uh, my camera isn't even on, but that's all right. I'll turn it on. All right, so, so you are, George, you noticed a pa it wasn't just your case, you noticed a pattern in practice. Oh, oh no, I've, I've come to find out that, uh, that the corruption is so deep and widespread in the state and federal courts uh, that it's like getting, if you go to court today, it's like getting into a card game with three close friends and an outsider, and you're the outsider. And once they get their hands on you, and you go into their courtroom, go into their jurisdiction, they know point full well that they will, uh, the, the lower court will rob you the first time. You'll take it to the appellate court. They will compound the crime by covering it up and rob you further. And then you wind up ultimately getting to the Supreme Court, and you wind up finding out that all along the way, you've been robbed by unsigned orders. And there's no track, there's no evidence whatsoever that the cases that you filed in your appeals ever left the park's office. So you really uh, uh, brought that point forth and, and pur uh, pursued that, that uh, the courts are, are handing out uh, unsigned orders. We'll get, to, uh, we, 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 we want to talk more about that and James, I know you already introduced yourself, but could you do it again? Certainly. I'm James Renwick Manship of Mount Vernon, Virginia, and I am an advocate for juries and jury rights, and I believe that with no jury, there is no justice. And if you know the jury just uh, system, then you can know justice in this system. Um, but knowing the jury system, you still were roadblocked, and, and that, that uh, your rights were deprived because you were denied the rights to, to the grand jury and to, uh, uh, well, to, to the grand jury, isn't that what you're talking it's about? It's not, not only the grand jury, only 2% of the people in the United States who ever request a jury proceeding actually get it. That's a statistic I didn't know, but I've got a statistic from the National Center for State Courts. When I was the president of Virginia Chronicle uh, newspaper in Virginia Beach in 2003-2004, I had one page that I was the editor for, and that was the Constitution and the Courts page. And so I did a lot of research on the courts, and the National Center for State Courts in Williamsburg, Virginia, had a study from basically 1993 to 2003. I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> okay, we'll edit that out. Ah. Okay, the people won't see that. Go. Um, and so there was a study at the National Center for State Courts for 10 years before, and I'm about to do it again. Anyway, um, and it said that there had been a 24% decline in jury trials nationwide in the preceding 10 years, and a 50% decline in Virginia. Wow. Well, that's pretty significant in and of itself. Well then, in 2008, in the State of the Judiciary Report, Chief Justice um, Leroy, or Le no, Chief Justice Hassel said that there had been a 69% decline in jury trials in the preceding nine years. from. 1999 to 2008. Now there's an overlap of those two studies, but basically it's a trend in the wrong direction. A jury trial is, that, that's an indicator like a, a canary in a coal mine that the oxygen of liberty of our legal system is perishing. Is well how was it done? How did, how did the judges do that? How did they, how did they trick us? And well, to, uh, taking away our rights to a grand jury. I can't answer that nationally. I can give you a possible explanation in Virginia, and that is in the early 90s, 
they passed a law to bifurcate jur jury trials. Uh -huh. Okay, and what that means is that first of all, you have to, essentially you have two jury trials anytime that you have a jury. One is to have the uh, innocence or guilt determined by the jury. And then, if determined guilty, then a second trial to determine what your sentence will be. All right, well, that means a lot of time. It takes a lot of time for a lawyer to prepare for a jury trial. And so the jurors say, first of all, you're going to have to have two trials if you have a jury, so it's going to double your cost or vastly increase your cost, plus it takes more time to prepare for a jury, so that's going to cost you more. And finally, you can't ever count on a jury. They're very fickle. They don't understand the law. And sometimes they're much... Well, that's what they That's, that's what, they, what the lawyers say. That's what the lawyers say and the judges to, say. No, the lawyers say to their clients. Uh -huh. And so they say they're fickle. And also, they sometimes are much more strict in the punishments they assign than is the judge. And I know this judge, he's a good guy, and so I think you'd be really better to uh, go with a ju judge trial. So, so, so you're telling me 50% of, uh, of uh, cases, uh, cases uh, were uh, uh, not allowed to be brought to juries because of what these lawyers said to their clients? I Even a much larger that. percentage than that. I can't believe no, that. No, right. the, the 10 years from the mid-90s to the... You know, or, you know, from 93 to 2003, it's about 50 percent, according to right. the National Center for State Courts. However, it went up to 69 percent yeah. from 99 to 2008. Oh, so what you say is say correct. Clients, yeah. it, it, or is it something more? It, what? All, just because of what lawyers tell their clients? It's, it, it, no, not entirely. Because it, it, I, a sales pitch, so to speak? Yes, I would say it's the sales pitch of the lawyers. Okay. It, as I said, it's more work for the lawyers. Yeah. They don't want to do that but work. But the lawyers work for the clients, and the clients can tell the lawyers how they want to proceed with their case, correct? That's, that's in fantasy land. Most yes. of the time, lawyers tell their clients how things are going to be. And that's they, one of the great problems. Unless you go back to them and say, I don't want it that way, I want it this Precisely. Way. If you're a client and you stand up right. for your rights and saying, I, I want, want a jury trial. There we go. And I will not do it any other way. Yeah. I personally have been falsely accused six times. A public defender said, you know, we're going to do this, this, and this, you know, plea. And so I said, look, you don't understand. First of all, I'm a minister. I can minister in jail or out of jail. I prefer to minister out of jail. But I am not going to do a lie to keep myself out of jail. And that's what you're asking me to do. Okay? A plea bargain is basically court-approved perjury. That's what a plea bargain is. Right. And that's what and most of the lawyers want to do. Who are innocent will just go for the plea bargain because it's going to be it's a guaranteed lesser charge than to go, to go up and stand up against the well, charge. Precisely. But, yeah. but okay, let's, let's, let's get back to these uh, prosecutors, all right? Now, 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 that's your defense attorneys telling you that. All right, well. And then the prosecutors... You know, say, well, you know, the, the juries, we don't want a jury and so forth like that. But they the, can't stop it. No, they can't. Well, they well, can yes, and they, they can't. Can. Last year, when I was falsely accused of unauthorized practice of law, yeah. I had a jury trial set. And on the day before Thanksgiving, yeah. they filed a motion based on some idiotic decision by some judge saying that I can be denied a jury trial. I can also be denied the opportunity to face my accuser. On what grounds? Because some judge in some ruling said that. Wait, he, uh, all right, so he's breaking and the law. And no, no... He's breaking the law, right? But it's a precedent. Right. And so some other judge can hang his hat on a previous judge's bad precedent. They right. do it all the time. Right, they do. Okay. No so, lawyer has bothered to take that case up okay, and so knock out we, that previous in that decision. In situation, how, do we, how does one create accountability? And then two. Once, well, how did once, I create okay, accountability? Okay, and then two, when, when you were let off on your charges because you because you uh, took the the ultimate risk and said you know you're not guilty. All right. Um, yeah, I refused to plea bargain. How I beat it was I had Tea Party people who were court watchers mm -hmm. 
I had a court reporter, so I had a digital recording. Right. I did a motion to admonish my public defender or court-appointed attorney for not properly preparing. Mm -hmm. That gave me a basis of appeal. And I also filed in federal court for am, um, ambush uh, prosecution, mm -hmm. last-minute uh, motion to remove the right to a jury trial, mm -hmm. and face my accuser. And I filed that in federal court on Friday when the state courts were closed, but the federal courts were open. And so then when I went to court on Monday, I told the judge, you know, I want to continue this, 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 and this. Everything else got turned down. And then I said, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to have a stay of these proceedings because there's federal proceedings going on right now for Are motion you for injunctive relief. Did you physically remove the case? Excuse me? You, you physically removed no, the case? No, no. I just filed in federal court against the prosecutor on the county level and the county judge who had okay. instigated the, the false charges. Okay, so this is a separate case against the public officials? Yes, it was a kind of constitutional right. civil rights violation lawsuit. But the mere fact that the county judge knew that the federal judges were looking at the case, mm -hmm. and that he had court watchers, and that he had a court reporter, mm -hmm. so that I would have a transcript of the proceedings, mm -hmm. made it so, it's, it's what I call the porcupine strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay, you make it so you're too prickly to swallow. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can beat these people at their own game okay. at times. Now, once you uh, won your case, excuse me. Once you won, you, you 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 were found innocent by right. The the judge found me not guilty and dismissed the charges. Okay. That was uh, okay. November 29th, a year ago exactly. Okay. Can, could you turn around and now sue the prosecutors? Yes, I could. Okay. So did you do that? I started to do that. Um, and False claims would be one. Well, well, there's, there's all sorts of different things. I actually went into the record and I found out that the judge, yeah. Lisa Main, had actually, she or one of her agents had removed a filing. Well, that's a felony. Right. Okay. So I, start, I started proceeding. I asked for a, a, a grand jury investigation of this mm -hmm. to both the Commonwealth attorney and the court clerk. Mm -hmm. uh, the court clerk responded to me. The Commonwealth attorney never did. Mm -hmm. um, the Commonwealth Attorney is a Democrat, the, co the court clerk yeah, is a Republican. Okay, so anyway, it didn't go forward. About that time is when I went to testify against a judge in Richmond, and I learned about this case in Arlington, and basically all my time has been consumed with the Arlington case since then. So that's why I didn't pursue my case, because I basically won it, and all the other thing would be essentially retribution against the, the judge and the prosecutor. Well, I mean, wouldn't it be a good thing if some of these prosecutors went down for well, yes, false it, yes, it, claims and then sent a, a message across the country that yes. they can't get away with this kind of thing? And yes, they, it would. But that's, they have put some risk on themselves when they do this? Well, Of you're, course, prosecutors haven't given Would you like me to answer? Well, I'm just saying, sort of giving you some, uh, some... I was starting to. Yeah, but... Okay. Know, just... just we're all friends here. Okay. Well, I, I try and answer <laughs> oh, your question, and you yeah. stop me from the process. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is... Uh, I did know. so in another arena. I've got about yeah. six cases going on. I yeah. don't have any income to support any of these. Right. I have to decide what is the best way to allocate my time and money. Mm -hmm. Okay? It wasn't for my simple little case of uh, unauthorized practice of law. Instead, I went after a former prosecutor on a death penalty case and got him arrested on the 10th of January, wow. and he got by DEA, you know, by various things, you, you push the air, you push the air, drug enforcement, yeah, wow. okay, because he'd been a druggie for decades, okay, and uh -huh. so I went to the Virginia State Police, recommended uh -huh. by a Commonwealth attorney from the south side of Virginia, uh -huh. who told me to go there, so they listened to me because I dropped his name, uh -huh. and so they listened to me. Okay. Then. I said that uh, the, there was a, the thing from 1999 that said he was skimming money from drug dealers. Mm -hmm. They then did something, and six days later, that Commonwealth attorney was arrested for drug dealing, witness tampering, and evidence tampering. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, the, that's a pretty significant It's issue. major. It's tremendously major. Then he tried to disqualify the people who were testifying against him. I did a whole bunch of court of public opinion things, knocked that out. Then I did a whole bunch of things in the, the Virginia State Bar about him. And he then pled guilty. Wow. And so the plea bargain was for 38 months. How much press did you get on this? A fair amount. Especially in the Washington Examiner, which is about the only honest paper 
you know, well, excuse me, the Times is honest, but it doesn't have the same investigative uh, focus that the Examiner does. Yeah. Okay, Jim, Jim, we'll get back to you. I just want to sure. give uh, George a little uh, sit here. So, did you did you do what uh, James did? Uh, uh, try to uh, try to uh, have. Did you have a case he tried to bring to the grand jury? What happened? Jim? I I'm, right now I'm involved in that. I'm right, uh, mine was totally different than his. Uh, I took uh, when they, they stole my business. I decided to go hire a lawyer and fight him. Hundred thousand dollars later, I decided that the judge. I saw how the judges were treating the attorneys. I won one, two, three jury ver jury trials. Uh, I won every trial. I proved my case. Uh, I took, and each jury trial was overturned by the same judge, who's the brother-in-law of the party opponent. Oh, so you won by the jury, you you won with the jury, and the judge took it away. Three, yes. and each time this judge... That is outrageous. Each time this judge hijacked the case from another judge. And right now I have him in the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Good, you haven't stopped. I haven't. This is 19 years later. 19 years. How I have it taken so long? Because the court system is absolutely corrupt. I mean... 19 uh, years on this one? 19 years, there's roughly 10,000 docket entries and 110 court cases a modern growing. A modern paraphrase of Article 40 of the Magna Carta is justice delayed is justice denied. Now that's a modern paraphrase. Mm -hmm. That ap actually happens to be the motto on the sculpture at the entranceway to the U.S. District Court on the Eastern District of Virginia in Alexandria, which is called the Rocket Docket. Um, but rocket Docket. Rocket Docket. So they supposedly handle things very quickly, and indeed they do, uh, where most courts require that you prosecute within, you know, 12 months. Mm -hmm. The Rocket Docket has now got a local rule that says that you have to proceed with your prosecution of the case within three months or else they will dismiss well, it. Here with George, we're talking 19 years. What's going on? Uh, That's what I'm saying. Is, the justice has been denied because justice has been delayed. Yeah, That's what I was trying to say. 19 years, how do, how do you justify that in you, any you, way? You don't, but you don't get, you, you, you cannot give up. Well, you cannot, you, you cannot give up. Doesn't, do, when you put a motion in, doesn't the court have so many days to answer, usually 90 or 120? No, the, well, the, usually it's, generally, usually it's, it's nine, nine, usually it's 10 or 21 or 30. 30. Usually 30. it's 10, 21, or 30 days. Not right. nine, the, the U.S. government gets 90 days. Okay. And when they don't, you can put in a summary judgment in your favor. You, you, you can are, request you, it, but that doesn't mean the judge is going to uh, you know, grant it. You, but he would have to. No, he doesn't. No. You, you're living. Where did you get this information Because we're doing that right now. <laughs> All right. Up in Connecticut, the Supreme Court had... had uh, seven days to sign an emergency motion is right in the statute. They got seven days, and that's it. And if okay? they don't, then what? Then, 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 then they went over, and my buddy, he put in a motion for, just like I say, summary judgment and default, mistrial, okay? And he's taking the matter to the federal courts. Okay, that's right. Right, because when the st he says, my activist friend, Michael Malacki, that when the state fails to rule on its own laws, then you can bring it to the federal court. Precisely, and that's what I've done with a grand jury request in Alexandria in October. Yeah. Uh, they denied the former daughter-in-law of the chief judge, whose former mother-in-law became a, a trustee of an estate and then robbed $90,000 from the estate. Nice. Okay, so when she tried, you know, the chief judge, the new chief judge says, well, we like Alona, we're not going to, you know, do anything against her. She took it all the way to the Virginia Supreme Court, the Virginia Supreme Court, you know, dismissed her case. So she asked for a, a uh, rehearing and she was denied. So that's when she came to me back in late August okay. and said, well, you know, I see you've helped people go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. And I said, yeah, but I wouldn't recommend it. Because the U.S. Supreme Court, in granting cert, yeah. grants less than three-quarters of one percent. Right. All right, now, 
Which brings, uh, I have to say this when somebody said, gives me that statistic, I say, is there any First Amendment left? If 99.9% .9 of all Supreme Court certiorari are systematically denied. It's not 99.9, .9, it's 99.2. <laughs> well, well, you know, with pro se point nine. Let, yeah. let, let me. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now you let, got a good point there. <laughs> let me hit you with reality. Yeah, we want to hear more from okay. you, George. Reality is, is, is you say that emergency motions. I've got three emergency motions yeah. in for Judge Roberts right now. Yeah. Now I've got an order from Judge Roberts, actual signed order, right. which I saw your video that that he picked out. And, and, and we have an actual signed order. Now, none of the emergency motions show up on the docket. Right. Okay, even though they were filed, even though they were sent out, none of these emergency motions show up on the docket. All the, all the documents that we went through, every order was unsigned except for the one signed order. Mm -hmm. five so five people five. don't realize... What was that order from Roberts? What? what was the it was a motion for an extension of time, right. granting me an extension of time to file my petition. Right. Okay? He denied it, right? No, he granted it. Good he deal. granted it. Okay? It's a signed order. Now... We're not asking much there. No. <laughs> well, the thing is, is if you have to sign a, an order to give somebody an extension of time to file a document, then there must be a signed order somewhere denying emergency motions, denying petition, uh, 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 all motions to the court. Mm -hmm. There must be a, a signed order for the justices to authorize the clerks of the court to issue so what denial statute? of... What practice book rule? What? It's called the Model Code of Appellate Procedure for administration of appellate courts. Okay. There is such a, a, a code, and it tells you how the administration procedure of a and appellate court is order. supposed to go. It says they must sign every order. Rule 56 says they must sign every order. Okay. Federal rules so, civil so, procedure. So, it's so cut and, bl and dry, all right? It's so black and white, all right? <clears throat> you, you, didn't, you didn't get the signature. It's so black and white. You look at the do the paper, and the signature is not and there. And I send the judge. Uh, so why why can't we get any justice here? Well, the thing is, you send the, it just like I've got my motion for reconsideration. An unsigned order has no force and effect against anybody in this nation. Period. So I don't care what. On so I I filed it uh, uh, the twenty eighth of, uh, of of October. Okay, we'll give them a little more time. You okay. <laughs> in the motion to reconsider. The first time they sent it back saying I hadn't complied by giving my affidavit with it. So I filed the affidavit with it. So the thing is, is no matter what, until they produce a wet signature, don't you find it ludicrous that you just heard that 92% of the orders... 99.2. 99.2% of the people in the United States who file a petition for written surgery are denied. And now, if you go to the National Archives, or the archives in, in, in Greenbelt now, and you ask to see any 10 to 20 cases for a five-year period, you will never find a signed order of any Supreme Court justice. And the same thing is happening now in the uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and all the other circuits around the country. They're all issuing these unsigned Why orders. wouldn't the judges simply sign? The because order? it's a liability. Once he puts his signature down, that means that he's looked at it, he's reviewed it, and he then can be held legally liable for and denial this is of due so process. so big. That is so big. What? They, why do they just so blandly break the law and not sign the orders? Because. And then how come we can't get any? Uh, I mean, who would you go to? The, the, Department the grand of Justice? jury. Could you, would you, could you go to the Department Citizen, of Justice? You've got the paperwork right here. The Citizens Grand Jury yeah. 
You go to the citizen. We just found this out. I don't. I'm not in, in contention with the the citizens' grand jury movement. For the most part, is conceived of as outside of the established uh, court system. I say that patriots first need to exercise within the system a revolution within the system, and that is to demand their rights to a grand jury. Yes, you're going to expect that they're going to throw up every obstacle, as they've done for me, you know, for the past 11 months here in Virginia. Um, but you just have to be persistent and keep going at it. All right. The problem is, is that a lone voice in the wilderness isn't heard. But if we had a thousand people saying, you know, with that one person, or even a hundred people with that one person saying, we want a grand jury to look into these wrong things. Well, in Virginia, at the end of the regular grand jury session, the judge is supposed to say to the regular grand jurors, is there anything that has been brought to your awareness or you're aware of that would make you want to vote to impanel a special grand jury uh, to deal with um, problems in the government. Well, that's essentially a jury instruction. Well, they've got whole jury instruction model instructions so that what is stated to them is full and complete and accurate. I maintain what the judges are saying in the grand jury sessions is not uh, a valid issue in describing the responsibilities of the grand jury in listening to citizens for a special grand jury. And so there's a basic problem that we have to uh, get past these judges who do not want citizens to be able to go to the grand jury because that will force accountability on the public servants. Whether they be executive public servants, legislative public servants, or judicial branch public servants, they do not want private citizens to go to the fourth branch of, ju fourth of, branch of government, which is the grand jury. Of course not, but there's, it doesn't matter because, because the citizens have an absolute right to take to a grand jury. Well, you a having, right is only right, viable if you can exercise it. Right. You well, have you, to try to exercise yeah, it and be denied. And you, and you call it in, in the in, in the, uh, in, on the in the form of the courts. You, you make the call, and they're supposed to act appropriately. But then they act illegally to prevent you from getting access. to Well, on the but on Monday just, last week, yeah. I went to the regular grand jury yeah. in Arlington. I yeah. sat in the courtroom for six hours. Yeah. I was on the 15th, the chief judge issued a, signed a final order saying you will not be allowed to go before the grand jury. And I wrote a response saying that is unconstitutional, it is my right to do so. So I showed up anyway. I had a deputy sheriff uh, <coughs> sergeant come up and say, the chief judge has said that you are not to talk to the grand juror and if you say a word to them you're going to be escorted from the premises. And I said that's in violation of... Uh, the law, it is my constitutional right to do so. So I am staying and I intend to talk to the grand jury or at least to the judge while the grand jury is there. He says, we'll have to escort you from the premises. So I said, that will be in violation of the law. So, uh, you know, they say their position, I restated my position. Then they had a deputy lieutenant come and tell me the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I said the same thing. So I stayed and when it came time for the jury to come back in, the clerk of the court went into there and briefed the jury on on something. That's not always the case, but he went in there, and he's the one who I'd asked to put me on the docket for the, the grand jury. So then they come out. The judge asks that question. I stand up and said, sir, I'd like to speak to what you just spoke. Mr. Manship, I told you that you weren't going to be able to say I've given you a final order. And I said, sir, I understand that, but that's not in keeping with Virginia law. I'd like to speak to an issue of corruption in the government. And of course, what's interesting is none of the five jurors even turned their head to look at me. Now, why would that be? If, if they hadn't been briefed to keep their eyes on the chief judge, it would be natural if you were in the, grand, in the juror box 
and the citizen stands up and speaks to the judge, it would be natural behavior to turn your gaze to the person who's speaking. Not one of the five did so. That's very curious, you know, personal behavior. It suggests to me that they were told that there's going to be some citizen who wants to speak to the grand jury, who's been told by the judge that he can't do so. So when you get into the courtroom, just watch the judge. Don't look at him because otherwise there's no logical explanation for them not behaving in a normal manner. So I'm just saying that all the way from the court clerk to the chief judge yeah, to the deputies and everybody. I thought that jury instructions, uh, uh, you know, basically both the defendant and the plaintiff were there to agree. That's for trial jury. Not, there's no real indication of a proper jury instruction for grand jurors. Uh -huh. That's the, one of the problems. Uh, that's one of the problems that needs to be fixed. Yes. All right. Have you heard about this uh, activist in Texas by the name of Randy Kelton? I have not. Okay. He, uh, remember that name. I will. Randy, Randy Kelton. He's got lots of videos on YouTube, and he's, he basically goes and demands access to the grand jury. Now, and they did the same thing, the same story to him, or they did to you. And he says, I want to talk to the bailiff. Arrest the judge. Bailiff, I order you to arrest the judge. He's breaking the law. And has that ever been successful? Uh, yes, to some extent. He sure, sure, he sure has got the uh, Texas judiciary on the run. Did one judge ever get arrested? No, but they started okay. behaving when they saw that these could be executed. Right. This, that, that this was possible. They started, the responses changed. That's one of the things that we citizens have to do. You know, the, what's problem in America and what the solutions are, are in America are the same three words. We, the people. We are the problem because we've been lackadaisical. We've been sitting on the couch watching TV and not paying attention to the fact that our republic is being stolen from us. Okay, that's one of the problems. But the solution is the same three words, and that's we, the people. We can get up off the couch, get going, get active, get involved, and start reasserting our rights in the courts, including our right to hold accountable public servants before the grand jury. When that happens, now when the public servants no longer have the policeman protected by the prosecutor and the prosecutor protected by the policeman who's protected by the sheriff who's protected by the judge, and so if they do something wrong, they're all in a, in a circle right. protecting each other. conspiracy. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> okay. It's, it's a, if you work with people, it's the thin blue line. You want to help and assist the people that you work with on a daily basis. It, it's not conceived of as a conspiracy. It's just helping out your buddy, helping out your coworkers. But then they don't think about the fact that this coworker has been doing something in violation of the law. How could they be violating the law if they're, they're law uh, enforcement people? How could they be violating the law? Well, there's countless cases of law enforcement people embezzling or doing this or bribes or kickbacks or whatever. That's, you know, 5% or less of the case. But what about when they overreach their authority and abuse a citizen without taking any money. Exactly. I'm not saying that these people are necessarily taking money. right to a remedy. Right. And so we citizens have to stand up. When we think of fixing our government, we think of changing the executive through the election, uh -huh. or we think of changing the legislative through election. But we do not think of the third branch, which has, we have a bicameral legislature, uh, House and a Senate, and we have a bicameral judiciary, a jury and a judge. The jury is to the House as the judge is to the Senate. And we have lost that concept of how our government is structured. Okay, George, do you want to add anything uh, to uh, you, you've wanted to present in front of grand juries? And oh, yeah. I, I, uh, I have asked I have petitioned the courts to, uh, since uh, 1995, I petitioned the U.S. Attorney's Office to 
uh, in panel of federal grand jury under 18 U.S.C. 3057. Okay, so you, you had this 19-year-old case where you've been doing that, right? And I'm still doing it because it's that's what the law okay. is. The law says that a grand... What if 100 years goes by and they haven't done anything yet? I mean, what's going on here? Well, I'm, I mean, 19 years is an awful long time. I mean, this, this, this should have been heard by now. Well, what do you, what do, you I mean, do? What do you do? You, you wake up each morning of your life and you've got a gun stuck to your head. You've got this mafia-controlled judicial system that we have now that is controlled 100% by the American Bar Association, and they control all your public defenders, all your prosecutors, all your court clerks, all your judges are, are members of the bar, 99% of them, and they're supported by a legislative branch of government that's also 98% or 95% in Warriors. some states, in some, in some states. states, in Virginia, amazingly, it's only about um, thirty-four percent of the legislature in Virginia is lawyers, which I pray may be a real opportunity for the advance of justice in Virginia, because a strong working majority is non-lawyers, and so there is the possibility that uh, something could be done. And indeed, the governor, when he was in the legislature, he was a lawyer, but he actually introduced legislation and campaigned on it for five or six or seven years to have judicial evaluations. Now, he wanted judicial evaluations to be done by lawyers, which I didn't agree with, but it's better to have some judicial evaluation than no ju judicial evaluation. I think lawyers should do evaluations, but I think common citizens you know, you and me should also be doing evaluations of uh, judges as to the, the proper performance of their duties. Well, I had the pleasure of speaking before the Virginia General Assembly last November, okay? I, I went down there and I spoke, and they have a, a, a unique system in Virginia where citizens, <laughs> where, where <laughs> citizens could come in and the judges had to come in for for a review every three years or so. Six years. Every six, six years. Six, years. And find out whether they are qualified, if there's any objections to their being reelected. And I spoke before them along with Dr. Pollock. And I applauded the uh, General Assembly for doing this because it, it, it added a element where the victims could actually come forth. Uh, you can only sit on the back side. Where the victims come forth and they could tell their story and, and oppose the re-election or reappointment of a judge. But I, I brought one thing, and, and Virginia is a commonwealth. Uh, I was unaware before I started dealing in Virginia that as a commonwealth, there is no uh, transcript of judicial proceedings. They're not a court of record as Maryland is. Maryland's court of record. I don't think that that's due to being a commonwealth. That's what a lot of people say. But the laws in Virginia are that um, this, you know, where in Virginia they've got it so every court hearing, general district court or uh, circuit court, is audio re recorded. Um, in no. No, because Dr. Pollock, we tried to get we, she had At least to, in Montgomery County, they are. Montgomery, in Maryland, in Maryland, they are all done. That's what I just said. In, in Maryland, in Virginia, they're all recorded. In, in Virginia, Virginia, they're not. They That's don't what even, I just said. They don't even tell the public that they have to, if they want to right. have it recorded, you have to go out and prearrange to have a court transcriber there. And I think that that is uh, That's correct. very dis, dis, uh, disingenuous. disingenuous to all the... Uh, people who come before it because you have no, without a transcript, you have no record for appeal. That's right. So yeah, you automatically I don't lost. get that. Now, that is, now you've brought up that contradiction. How does, how does the Commonwealth of Virginia get around, uh, explain that away, that, that it deprives people of well, rights to appeal because you can't get a transcript? Well, I mean, that's pretty basic well, in the case. The, the old saying of ignorance of the law is no excuse. Right. Ignorance of the law or ignorance of the court proceedings that they're not recorded is no excuse that they're not recorded. You're supposed to know that you're supposed to bring your own court reporter. 
Oh, oh, so you have a right to bring your own court report. Yes. But the, oh, well, that's the cool. average citizen who goes in okay, I got one has minute left no here. idea. And, and how I that started does. this back in 2007 was that there was a guy named uh, Mark Young yeah. who did uh, court reporting. Yeah. And he says, well, there's no study guide or no certification to be a court reporter. So I went and swore in as a court reporter. Yeah, that's great. And so dude. then I started doing pro bono court reporting. Well, that's a good thing. Because you that... You have to pay a huge fee. That way I was able to that's force not... the lawyers and judges to speak honestly because I was going to have a recording of what they said. Okay, what states uh, have, have it like that? I don't know. Uh, I know. I have no idea what other states are. I know that... Kentucky has about 95% of its cases are video recorded, okay, because there's a place called Jefferson Audiovisual Services out of Louisville, Kentucky, and so they've got the contract there. There are four uh, jurisdictions in Virginia that have the Jefferson Audiovisual uh, Recording Service, and Roanoke, County of Roanoke is one, and I did a jury trial there, and I've got the video of my conducting a jury trial pro se. Nice. I've got all the videos okay, of mine. Okay, take a break. I need yep. a chance to take. You know, this, this, one thing about this camera that's stupid.